Hi, um, I'm Aaron. I love that sound. That's really nice. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to say a couple of words about what I do, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Maria because Maria is going to do the first half of our presentation, and then we're going to switch. Um, I'm the editorial director for Michigan Publishing and for the University of Michigan Press. Um, that may sound a little weird. It's a little bit out of um, the ordinary for, I think, most of the people in this room. Um, but the University of Michigan Press, as you probably do know or you may not know, is actually a part of the University of Michigan Library. Um, so I am a librarian, um, but I'm also um, the senior manager in charge of acquisitions editors for the University Press, and I acquire um, books for the press. Um, so a lot of my thinking about um, publishing within the library is informed by my experience of publishing in a much more traditional press context. Um, I think that's about it in terms of hellos. Sorry about that, I'm short. Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Maria Bonn, and uh, I was formerly the, the head, the associate university librarian for publishing at uh, the University of Michigan. I don't know if Charles is out there, but he's got the job now. I used to be his boss, now Charles gets to boss him around. Um, and pr in my current gig, I'm teaching at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois. And part of my charge there and my ambition is uh, to build curriculum around uh, libraries as publishers uh, and around a variety of scholarly communications issues, but we often end up talking about publishing in that context. Uh, so uh, as I introduced myself, I was thinking, normally it would be a little bit hubristic to get up here and say, hey, I wrote the book on academic libraries and scholarly publishing, but I did. Really, um, it's been out about three weeks, so I get to uh, say it. And I would, um, actually I edited the book with Michael Furlow. It's called Getting the Word Out, Academic Libraries and Schol uh, Scholarly Publishers. Uh, it's, there's an open access version online which your nimble Googling skills will turn up pretty quickly. Uh, and my editor promised me a discount code for all of you for those who like print but I think she forgot, uh, but I will get it from her and make sure Sarah gets it out to you in case you would prefer a print edition or you're one of those kids we heard about that like print better. Uh, so uh, I, I, while I would normally be uh, shy about um, uh, shameless self-promotion, um, I am not um, shy about uh, uh, shamelessly promoting my authors uh, because they're great and because a lot of them are here. Uh, so thank you, uh, Charles, Kevin, Corey, uh, Sorrell, uh, let me make sure I do it, Sarah, uh, Catherine, somebody else I'm sure I'm forgetting, but I think of you all the time. I just ha haven't spotted you yet. Um, so they're all in here, and um, I'll, be, I'll leave it to you to discover the pleasures and treasures of the book. Uh, but I did want to mention that in this context, the past day, I've thought several times about the chapter that begins the book, which is by Paul Courant and Elizabeth Jones. It's called, let me get it just right, um, Scholarly Publishing as an Economic Public Good. Um, and they take a kind of historical long view on scholarly publishing. And one of the things they point out is that the university presses at Johns Hopkins, University of California, University of Toronto, University of Washington and the University of North Carolina, to name just a few, were all started within and by their libraries. And hey, I think they've done pretty good, uh, fi financial, recent financial strain notwithstanding. Maybe there's something to this library publishing thing. Uh, so uh, we, I think, and I am often, often in the place of thinking about, we're doing something new here. Well, about 100 years new, uh, li libraries acting as publishers. Uh, so because I'm an old timer, um, I get to tell stories. Uh, so I uh, want to refer to a couple of anecdotes from my early publishing history. Uh, and one is in about 2000, uh, I'm paying a visit to the California Digital Library. And I'm actually just tagging along with my spouse who's doing some consulting. 
And the then director said, oh, your wife's a librarian. We had a lot of those here. Bring her along. We'll find somebody for her to talk to who might have turned down a trip to California, right? So I get there. Uh, Dick Lucier, the director, hands me a cup of coffee and says, tell me about what you do. And I said, well, actually, I'm just starting something called the Scholarly Publishing Office. We're trying to build some publishing capacity in the library. Um, and his eyes lit up, and he said, oh, you got to talk to Catherine. And it's Catherine Candy, not Catherine Mitchell, who's also here, uh, but who is her successor. Um, we're, we're starting this e-scholarship thing. We've got repository. We're doing stuff with UC Press. We're trying to publish. Uh, so Catherine took me off. Uh, for coffee, then lunch, and we emerged about four hours later. Uh, firm friends who had finally found someone who understood each other. Uh, and so we had a great time talking. Uh, we, were, we were really delighted to find someone who was sharing the same kinds of projects and problems. Uh, and then um, I left, and although I was delighted to have found Catherine and shared a very productive relationship with her over many years um, of sharing our experiences, and then I and through her I met Catherine Mitchell, who we heard from earlier. Uh, I walked away with envy, too, because I kept thinking, CDL, she's got, my California friends can correct me on this, she's got 16 campuses. Now that's an opportunity for some scale. If you can change the culture on 16 campuses, you can have an impact. You can really build a community there. Now they told me all sorts of reasons why there's problems in having 16 campuses, too. Uh, but I, I was I'm envious of that opportunity to build scale, which I didn't see in my efforts at Michigan, which is a big place, but still felt small compared to that. Um, so the, you know, that's one moment in my early history. Uh, and another, um, in 2004, when the Scully Publishing Office had gotten off the ground a little bit, I was invited to run a panel at the Society for Scholarly Publishing annual meeting um, with Catherine to talk about what California was doing with publishing, uh, with a representative from Cornell, David Ruddy, who was here last year, but I don't see him this year, uh, about what they were doing at Cornell. And we were pretty much the only game in town when it came to what we now think of as library publishing. Uh, my paper was entitled, What Are Those Libraries Up To and Should I Care? Uh, and so I got up and started talking about the broad scope of, of library publishing, what we were all trying to do. Um, and I explained to the uh, assembled masses there that the library had received an infusion of funding from our provost with the specific directive to put it toward an area of strategic investment. And the library decided to invest in two things at the time. Uh, one was our institutional repository, it was the funding that got that off the ground, and the other was what became the Scholarly Publishing Office, um, was myself and uh, two assistant librarians. And we did this in part because when the provost gave us this money, she did say the area you define for strategic investment, but if you could do something about the publishing problem, that, I'd like that. Um, and because this was something we had been thinking about investing in anyway, we said, oh good, make the provost happy and get some investment money in this area. Um, and I said to that group that I, at the time, hoped the provost understood that me and my two assistant librarians were not going to take down Elsevier. Um, and, uh, and that everybody laughed a lot at that. Um, and then um, I explained to them that when I talked about library publishing that day, um, I did not want to talk about institutional repositories, which were burgeoning. Um, I did not want to talk about um, independent open access publications, which were kind of popping up all over the place, but about the creation of original content in the library. I was going to put the IRs and the OA movement, put a pin in them, and put them over here. Well, at the end of the talk, I said, so this is what we're doing. We've had a little bit of impact. We're really just getting off the ground. We have a lot of ambition. But hey, if I take that pin out of the institutional repositories and the budding open access movement and get with my friends here up at the front, the other library publishers, we all get together, maybe then Elsevier's got something to at least think about. Um, as I think of this period in my thinking about publishing out of libraries as the thousand flowers boom, bloom moment, uh, let a lot of stuff happen. Let's see how we can change the landscape. Let's provide alternatives, get things cooking, get things growing. 
So all those wanted all those flowers to bloom, and where are we today? Well, there's been this great development, the Library Publishing Coalition. Look at all you beautiful flowers out there. You're all growing, you're all blooming. Um, it's at a scale that when I gave that talk in 2004, I would not have uh, imagined was possible. I could only have hoped would become possible. But there's a problem. And what I see as that problem is that there's still microactivity scattered across the country, across the world, and things like LPC are a start. Uh, but we're now at the point where there's enough activity to be taken seriously, but we have to assert our presence and be about more than innovation and experimentation. Uh, we need to mainstream our activities, we need to mainstream our publications, and we need a long-term plan. Um, and I think it's important at this moment to design and build, looking forward, five to 10 years, a, a plan that, that kind of range. So where are we now? Um, I think we're in a moment to be deliberate and proactive, not just reactive. And I'm not the first one at this conference to say that. I've heard that from a few people. Um, we, we're at a time when things can happen. So how can we make them happen in a way that has significant positive effect in libraries and on scholarship? How do we make sure that we are planting seeds that can germinate and thrive and nurture the scholarly community and not just disperse with the winds? How do we make that happen? Well, before I get to that, I'm sure I have all the answers on that. Um, let's talk a little bit about where we don't wanna be. And I wanna uh, put forward two cautionary tales, if you will. Um, and I'm gonna pick on institutional repositories for a moment. I love them, I helped run one, um, but I'm gonna pick on them. So repositories have been in play, I would say, easily since the beginning of the century. Um, and over time, our awareness has built that having research output lie inert in a repository is not maximizing that research's benefit. Repositories are full of good stuff. Does anyone know it's there? How widely is it being used? Uh, the added urgency, uh, the, the government policies on access to federally funded research have added urgency to the effort to collaborate to ensure viability and use of research products. That's cool. Uh, so for example, we have SHARE. I'm sure many of you are familiar with SHARE, the Shared Access Research Ecosystem coming out of ARL. And SHARE's mission, as stated in its press release, is to help ensure the preservation of access to and reuse of research outputs. Services provided will include a notification service to publicize research events, a central registry of research outputs, a discovery layer, and a content aggregation layer to facilitate the mining of large volumes of content. Well, that's cool too. But shouldn't we have been thinking about these things all along? We're 14 years in and saying, huh, how are these things gonna work together exactly? How are we gonna get maximum benefit from them? Um, in another context, I'd point out that university presses, a more established, we could even say elderly kind of publisher, um, are also playing collaboration catch up. Uh, collaboration and its benefits are an area of focus after years of market competition. Uh, the Mellon Foundation recognized need in this area to the extent they made it a funding priority. Um, and then uh, just this February, in a message on the AAP list, uh, the, the message told us, um, the prevailing idea coming out of the interactive plenary on the strategic plan at the New Orleans AAUP meeting was to focus on collaboration and to seek opportunities for groups of presses to work together to find efficiencies and economies of scale. Uh, and, and if I continued much longer reminiscing, I would tell you about uh, the many times at my time at the University of Michigan Press uh, where I had congenial but aborted conversations with my friends and colleagues at Wayne State University and Michigan State University Presses. And if I can find Charles, I'll say, have you had this lunch yet? Um, where we 
talked about how maybe the time had come for one University Press of Michigan. It would be great. We could spread out our production capacity and activity. We could build centers of expertise. We could locate titles with the press staff best equipped to realize their potential, no matter which door they came in. Uh, of course, it never went anywhere. Um, there were just too many questions of both logistics and identity. Who was going to get the books about the Great Lakes? What about the books about Detroit? Who would publish those? Um, and that, those are just a couple examples of the kinds of problems we ran up against very fast. So even though we kept saying, There's, we could get some economies of scale here, it didn't happen. So publishing libraries don't compete in the direct market space in the same way. But that doesn't mean they are necessarily driven to collaborate. Let's not get ourselves in position of scrambling to connect and to collaborate after our efforts have matured. Let's build it in from the beginning. So you're saying great. And then you're saying, build it how? Build it where? What are we building exactly? And these are good questions. Uh, so let me now fail to answer them, uh, but let me raise some possibilities. Uh, so you know, why and how would we begin to work together? And what I want to argue for is the strongest possible integration of our efforts, uh, that we identify common problems, and I know we were doing this over cocktails last night, and there are probably other areas, more formal, where we can identify common problems, um, and we collaborate to address them. And I would argue that while many of us are small and scrappy, I'm going to stress scrappy. I was talking to Kevin about this last night. I said scrappy, and he said crappy. No, it's, many of us are small and scrappy. Uh, if we join forces, we can create a critical mass that affords the opportunities to realize the potentials of scale, potential of scale. Scale, it's all the rage these days. We hear a lot that we should do it big to do it right and to maximize investment and impact. In brief, don't work away in our art artisanal mom and pop libraries without recognizing the possible gains of interinstitutional and interpublisher cooperation. And even if Sarah gets us all organized and pulling together, we're not going to create the anti-Elsevier, the anti-Blackwell, name, name your favorite big powerhouse profit publisher. But I do believe that cooperation and collaboration can create some of the economies of scale that can further the impact and significance of publishing from and in libraries. Uh, so uh, extra points for anyone who can identify where the still is from. You know? It's from the movie Divergent. Uh, this is the Abity faction, which is the peaceful, happy faction. They dress in nice colors and play the banjo a lot, and they feed everybody. They all work together, and they feed everybody else. Um, and uh, I've found myself thinking of this, about how are we going to feed those scholars? We've got to get together and feed, feed, feed the research machine. Um, so how are we going to feed all those scholars? Where, where could we begin to collaborate and work together? Well, when we talk about publishing in libraries, we tend to go first to the notion of a common platform. And I've been there, I've thought about that a lot. And this is a tantalizing place to begin, thinking about what to do. But I'm gonna say, let's not focus on that too much. There are already a lot of platforms out there. And here I'm gonna wave politely at all our sponsors back there and assure the ones that are still here that I don't think of them as fungal. Um, but there, there are platforms. Um, many of us, of you, are using OJS. Um, which is an open platform. Uh, there are commercial platforms. There are things people have developed themselves. Uh, so they're there, and various projects have found various ways of managing their content based on their own needs and local contexts. And we will all continue to choose platforms on the basis of what is the best match for our resources, both our skills and our finances, and the needs of our content and its creators. So if we're not happily uniting on a common platform to connect and integrate, where else might we start growing together? Well, 
I think that working on issues of discovery and impact are a prime area for uh, collaboration between publishing libraries. And I think it's a good time to take a collective step back to thinking about libraries as, as collectors rather than libraries as publishers. We're libraries. We collect things. But we are not, for example, maximizing impact of our publications because we're not including our, our, our products, our publications, in our catalogs and discovery systems in uniform ways. This should not be a problem for libraries given our traditional expertise. We should, we're the ones who should be able to figure this out. Um, and in more in the cautionary tale vein, I might point to um, Knowledge Unlatched, which has opened up some really great titles, uh, but from the folks I've talked to in libraries, it's a little bit hard getting them into the workflow and the collection. Uh, we're, not, we're not well prepared to deal with that. And if any of you uh, stop by uh, Eric's poster back there on the left, the Unglued uh, poster, uh, its theme is, guess what, it's kind of hard to distribute free stuff. Um, and I know in my own work as an open access publisher, I ran against this. We made this thing, there's this great thing. So how do we get it out into the network, the channels? How do we get libraries to acquire it? How do we incentivize uh, collections? How do we incentivize technical services to treat the, those materials, the free materials particularly, in the same way they would treat materials that we purchase? So I see, I see for us, us in this room, us at this con conference, a big opportunity in our getting together to create venues for awareness, for amplification, marketing, discoverability, acquisition, in the sense of, in the library sense of adding materials to collections and catalogs. How do we get our stuff not only out there but visible and thus more likely to be used? So making visible to discovery sources, services, uh, aggregating publication metadata, and I dream of doing that and then uh, having a good API layer that would allow people to do interesting things with our aggregated publication metadata. And if you are familiar with the DPLA apps uh, that people have bit, built to do stuff with DPLA stuff, uh, wouldn't that be great if people were doing that with uh, publications coming out of libraries? Um, so in, in brief, figuring out some way to get into acquisition streams, which is hard to do for stuff you don't buy. Um, and maybe we should collectively engage vendors in this conversation. Maybe we should build our own systems. Uh, those might be portals, registries, alert systems, feeders into acquisition streams. And all of the, any of these methods that we began to work on together, I think they're gonna be more attractive to our our scholars and our peers in, in libraries, if there's a lot of stuff. So, hey, there's a lot of good content there. We should do something with it, uh, rather than one-off publications or even 20-off publications dotted around the landscape. Um, I think we can also ask ourselves, and this would be another long conversation, if there are ways to scale up collectively to make production more efficient. Can we share expertise through cooperation, through cost sharing, shipping, around, uh, shipping the work around to, area, to centers of expertise? So how could we make our production more cost effective? Well, there's some other ways, and I'm gonna turn the mic over to Aaron to talk about some ideas he has about how we, uh, we might uh, think about working together. So, um this bullet list is broken into four points. The second two are my points, and um, <clears throat> they have question marks after them, um, which is meant, among other things, to indicate I don't really think I know the answers here, um, but I do find these to be really important um, things for us to think about going forward, and <clears throat> really hard things for us to think about going forward. Um, I. In, in talking with Maria about this um, presentation, I kept being the sort of uh, naysayer and, the, and the, uh, the, the gloomy one, which is basically, as anyone will tell you, my, my, uh, my inherent nature. Um, <laughs> but 
Um, I also like uh, challenging problems. And <clears throat> the question of um, prestige has always bothered me. Um, ever since 2009 when I started working in the scholarly publishing office, even though uh, the way that I was working in that um, shop was not exactly on the front lines of journal publishing. Um, this guy, I don't know if you can see him, but um, I don't know who he is, but this is what I feel like when I think about um, the question of um, uh, trying to accomplish um, the accrual of cultural capital of the sort that um, counts and tenure and promotion review um, in a new system, in a, um, in a library publishing context. Prestige is kind of a dream of the unified field, by which I mean um, it seems like an impossible aspiration at times. Um, so why do I think that? Why is, um, is it impossible to, uh, or does it seem impossible to accrue cultural capital um, for our publications? Is it about peer review? No, basically it, it can't be about that because um, most of us do employ peer review in, um, in most of what we do in journal publishing and, and so forth. Um, the problem, um, <clears throat> the nature of, the problem is with the nature of prestige economics uh, and it depends in large part on a fairly strict rationing of material, which is to say that um, prestige is connected to scarcity. Um, uh, it's not just about guarantees of quality control via peer review. Um, it's also this special aura of nomination um, in a very limited environment that we have lots and lots and lots of scholars who want to be published, um, but we only have a few slots for them to be published and we only have a few jobs in the professoriate um, for them to occupy. So um, as Martin Eve uh, mentioned at the beginning of our um, conference yesterday, and as he discusses in his uh, recent book, uh, Open Access in the Humanities, prestige and quality are not synonymous. Uh, prestige is a proxy measure for quality that is gained through an economic rationing of material. Prestige economically mirrors academic labor scarcity because it tends sorry, it stands as a surrogate. Um, stands as a surrogate um, put in terms of somewhat reductive, uh, somewhat reductive practical example. Um, this basically means that prestige economics saves time when you have 500 job applicants um, and you need to narrow that uh, list down to three finalists. Um, since there are relatively few slots for employing them. Um, limiting the number of sufficiently prestigious publications uh, perpetuates a proxy system that the Academy finds efficient enough. Um, but prestige via scarcity fails as a proxy measure insofar as it is inherently conservative. Um, it's established slowly. This is an argument you hear over and over again um, with uh, from big publishers um, and also small publishers that, um, that the prestige was hard won. Um, and that's true. Um, but uh, it also means that these micro monopolies that emerge, um, that is um, small sets of publishers, small sets of authors, um, each of whom are more likely to stick to trends of thought they feel confident they can sell are um, in the um, in the majority, um, small as that may be. Um, so the hard truth here is that um, there aren't any shortcuts to achieving this proxy measure for quality. Um, and maybe um, we shouldn't even be aspiring to the same kind of prestige anyway. But if we're not aspiring to some kind of prestige, then um, I'm not sure what we are trying to do. Um, that might be a somewhat controversial thing to say, I don't know, um, and we can, we can have it out in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> the fact is, I don't think that um, even though it's, it's hard to achieve prestige, and it's even harder to achieve the very specific kind of prestige that um, is 
generated through scarcity um, and the, the slow process um, of building lists and so forth that university presses and Elsevier, et cetera, um, have accomplished over time. It doesn't mean that um, it's impossible. It doesn't mean we can't offer something more reputationally powerful than we currently offer, um, only that we have to be prepared to be deliberate in the pursuit of offering such a thing. And I mean deliberate in the sense of intentional on the one hand, but also uh, laborious on the other hand. Um, it, it will take time, um, and that's obvious because we've been working at it now for um, over a decade. And there are, there are success stories, certainly. Um, the University of Michigan um, has the Philosopher's Imprint, which is um, a very high impact factor journal. Um, but it's a kind of, um, I think, I mean, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I, but I think that it is kind of an exception that proves the rule in, in, in terms of that kind of success. Um, um, so the question is what kind of alternative uh, might we hope for and, and what does it have to do with scale? Um, I think that when it comes to questions of prestige, scale, uh, which is often thought of as a technology problem, might actually be uh, better imagined as a social problem and that um, we have an opportunity um, so far largely untapped um, to capitalize on uh, a massive amount of subject expertise uh, in the belly of our libraries. Um, we have subject specialists in all of our libraries, most of our libraries, um, who could serve as a kind of um, reviewer base. Uh, it's a different kind of review, but, um, <clears throat> but it's easy for me to imagine, or at least not impossible for me to imagine, a uh, kind of glue layer of the sort that um, Martin Eve mentioned yesterday morning. Um, that is a modular solution to shared problems associated with peer review and the genealogy of validation academics expect and need to progress professionally. Um, a glue layer of our own um, for this, um, peopled by uh, the expertise, well, peopled by subject specialists and their expertise. Um, as Eve mentioned also, uh, if say the University of Michigan popped up and offered this service or, or offered itself as a hub, that would be a problem politically. Um, but the LPC has this kind of politically neutral status um, under the auspices of an organization like this. It's, it's feasible to imagine that we might organize um, a kind of seal of approval, um, a networked back credential that could eventually comp compete with other more venerable proxy measures for quality. Um, what, how would we do that? What would that look like? Is that crazy? <laughs> um, Maybe it is, um, but I want to believe that it isn't. Um, and I want an organization like this to tackle that kind of problem. Um, other hard stuff. Uh, I haven't solved, obviously, well, I'm, I think I actually have solved the credentialing problem. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I don't think that. Um, other hard stuff, who pays for lunch? Um, or the problem of labor. Every academic publisher will tell you and has told you um, open access isn't free. Uh, somebody has to pay. I feel like I hear that um, once a week, twice a week. Um, and it seems like it's always phrased that way. <laughs> but anyway, um, and on some level, that's an unassailable claim. It's true. Academic publishing is not and never will be, never has been a lab labor free enterprise. Um, but cost does not equal value, um, and conflating the two is a common fallacy. Um, value in this context is more properly thought of in terms of use value in the sort of Marxian uh, sense, um, or in our habitual nomenclature, impact. Does it get used? Does it get taught? Does it inspire further research uh, you know, building of further research. Um, that's where real value is. Um, 
So rather than getting distracted by the specter of cost, um, which every library activity already generates, um, we need to focus on getting the greatest possible return for our extant investment. Uh, as Maria uh, pointed out with the flower analogy, we have all of these programs. We're already publishing a great deal of high quality scholarly content, uh, relatively low cost. Um, it's not free, that's true, um, but uh, we're, we're managing to pull it off so far. Um, can we reorganize enough of our efforts as libraries, not just our little scholarly communication departments spread across um, the country and the world, but um, as libraries, to expand the influence and reputation of library publishing without significant new expense? I think we probably can, um, but again, this is not, I'm not pretending this is an easy thing to achieve. Um, but for reasons I'll get into in a minute, um, I think it, it's a very important thing to consider uh, doing. Um, but at the most immediate level, uh, the question is, how might we incentivize library domain experts to contribute to an effort like this? Um, I say this as a former library domain expert, subject specialist for English language and literature at Michigan. Um, I would have been happy to participate in this kind of work. Um, and even as the, sub or, sorry, as the editorial director at the press, I have um, served as a peer reviewer for, um, for articles. Um, I've served as a peer reviewer for an article by someone in this room. <laughs> um, and it got published, I think. Um, I recommended publication in any case. Um, so, um, Another question, at what non-financial costs might we attempt to standardize our prismatic array of homegrown solutions? Um, what are the reputational um, compromises we have to be willing to make as institutions to collaborate? And this is getting back to that, um, the virtue of an organization like LPC as a politically neutral entity or hub um, because um, as, uh, one of my colleagues was um, fretting about uh, about half an hour ago. Seems like turf wars in academia are um, inevitable and yet they seem to make no sense. Um, <clears throat> so how can we avoid turf wars? Um, other hard stuff. Um, again, this image I'm gonna have to explain. <laughs> um, that's a school of fish. Um, so that's my explanation of that. Um, what it has to do with the virtue of selfishness, I hope will become clear, but um, virtue of selfishness, I hate that I use this, that phrase, but um, I couldn't resist. Uh, it's the title of an Ayn Rand book. I'm not uh, endorsing Ayn Rand in any way, but sometimes, you know, even a broken clock is right half the time, you know, twice a day, whatever. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, the virtue of selfishness, um, pardon a whiff of kind of polemic here. Um, I know I've already been um, expressing the sort of whiffs of polemic already, but um, I, I hope it doesn't offend your nostrils too much. Um, we've been talking about the need for sharing rather than competing. Um, but I also want to say that being selfish uh, as a group is important, um, and it, it's important to be honest about that. Um, not selfish with each other uh, as libraries um, or divisions of libraries, um, but rather selfish with respect to our collective existential position um, in the scholarly communication space. Um, as Maria's already mentioned, uh, scale is, you know, is very hot right now, and so we're giving a talk about scale, uh, not because it's a very hot thing to do, but because there is some legitimacy um, to, uh, to this fixation. Um, and there's this raft of initiatives currently in play to help university presses partner strategically um, for a number of reasons, but um, chief among them as I see it, uh, in order to survive, um, in order to respond to growing pressures to do open access um, while 
still making money. Um, and also in order, of course, to continue to do what they do very well, um, to add value to scholarly outputs through filtering, framing, and amplification, as Simon Baskar describes it, um, the currently very costly functions um, whereby publishers select, assess content, and increase consumption or awareness of that content. Um, library publishing emerged as a small but disruptive alternative. Um, as Maria said, she never hoped, at least in the early days, to kill Elsevier, um, but um, to sort of introduce a challenge of some sort to um, get them to think about whether maybe they should um, change their practices a little bit. Um, and uh, what started as a small but disruptive alternative to market-based publishing activity um, is getting bigger and, and has more critical mass. Um, an effort to expand the scale and appeal of that effort uh, needn't be directly antagonistic to university presses um, and their activity, but library publishing has developed an increasingly distinct agenda, and at some level, feeding this is a matter of survival also and self-interest. Um, the library must continue striving to resist further disintermediation from its pride of place at the center of the university information network. By engaging the prestige question, we might increasingly compete in the domain of filtering and amplification that have traditionally been the special province of traditional publishing businesses. Um, Taking this opportunity seriously in a context like this, uh, that is cross-institutional initiatives um, designed to expand our offerings, to um, increase the value of our offerings to the professoriate. Um, will help us resist uh, ghettoizing and uh, will instead further define the specialness of library publishing Articula help us to articulate and mobilize the value proposition of publishing as a work of the library, a phrase I am fond of. Um, and that's part of what the library needs to do as it um, figures out, continues to figure out how its role, um, its sort of old roles that are dying off can be transformed into new roles that are still very important. So that's the end of what I have to preach on. <laughs> um, this slide was Maria's. <laughs> yes, as uh, Aaron alluded to, as we were preparing over the past, uh, I don't know, tossing back ideas back and forth for a while, um, he kept saying to me, I don't want to be a bummer, but, um, and I would, my role was to say, hey, you know, if we just get organized, come on, we can do this. Uh, so I wouldn't let him end with, I don't want to be a bummer, but anyway, and I don't think he was, actually. I find what he said quite hopeful, uh, but I would end with a challenge, um, and this is to return to our gardening metaphor. I thought about saying, well, it's time for our flowers to have some artful arranging, uh, but I'd like something a little less ephemeral, because it, if you have a beautiful bouquet on your dining room table, you know the petals are scattered around a couple days later. Um, I think this is a moment in which it is becoming imperative to shape the environment, uh, to take charge of our destiny, if you will, um, and not just wait for chaos to hit. Uh, so we're all busy, we're getting things going, and then we go, oh, what are we gonna do about this thing that we did? Uh, Let's, let's not put ourselves in that position. Um, instead, let's build the thing that we want, that we want to build. Uh, thank you.